Good morning, everyone. Buongiorno. My name is Hamad Bouamim. I'm uh, the deputy chairman of the ICCWCF and the president and CEO of Dubai Chamber of Commerce. We'd like to welcome you to the plenary session on the second day, Global Mobility. Just want to say, last night we had a great evening with the music and opera at the Piazza Castello, and uh, the food was great, the drink was great, so we'd like to thank Torino for that. Just uh, to warm up everybody, uh, today we have uh, this important topic in mobility, and I must admit we have also great speakers here with us. When I was requested to moderate the session, initially I felt uh, this is not one of my areas of expertise, but I did some research, and uh, I was very comfortable. Of course, I have a great support with me here in the panel. So uh, just, just to put things into context, global mobility is a very important subject as more and more businesses becoming more global. Both employers and workers require more flexibility cross borders to meet their needs. The availability of skills is an important factor in economic growth and business developments. All companies, big and small, look to adapt labor markets to stay competitive. Of course, global migration policy and laws is controlled by uh, governments. And immigration is a sensitive topic and sits at the heart of national identity. And uh, we will talk more about uh, these issues. Just uh, to highlight a few backgrounds based on the research I did, it's interesting to note there are 230 million international migrants around the world, and that's approximately 3% of the total world population. And uh, the fact that half of this total immigrants live only in 10 countries, which is uh, interesting to note that also United States sits in the top of that list and the, with uh, 50 million uh, population of migrants and then Russia, Germany, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, UK, France, Canada, Australia, and Spain. This is the order of the top 10 countries. It's also interesting to note my country, United Arab Emirates, has almost 84 of our population are international migrants. I just want to show you a slide I received from a friend, Mick Fleming, from Atlanta. Uh, it was uh, uh, posted a few weeks ago, and it's it's very nice, colorful, which uh, I understand it might be confusing, but this is shows the flaws between the top 50 countries that sent and received migrants during the years of 2005 and 2010. Just to highlight. Uh, Something here, if you look at this, this is maybe the biggest, uh, more or less, I would say, arrow going from Mexico to United States. That's when between these years, the biggest flow went from Mexico to US in terms of, of numbers. Of course, you see all these arrows going from some countries to some other countries showing these flows that I'm talking about, but also, what, what interests me in that uh, graph to see uh, my country as well, has in maybe having the second largest one after Mexico to US, is from India to United Arab Emirates. And uh, it's a it's very interesting graph showing where migrants going from to which uh, countries during the past uh, number of years. And this is, again, as I said, between 2005 and 2000 and 10. So I'm just going to go away from that. It's too distracting, actually. Uh, and another thing I read recently was an article by uh, Harold James, 
professor at Princeton, Princeton University talking about Europe, saying Europe movements against moving. And this is maybe, as he indicated, the largest unsolved issue in the European Union, which is mobility. And the European integration was intended to make it easier and more attractive for European to move from one country to the other. According to this vision, the Europeans had the nation to lose and the continent to gain. Of course, that was, I would say, in theory, the theory of a single labor market. However, the recent developments that's happening here in Europe indicate that people are more worried about losing the nation. So it was only after the recent global financial crisis that migration really took off here in Europe, and the results have not been so great. In fact, whether it is at the destination countries, but even recently with the development in Poland at the countries of origin. There are more uh, nationalism or nationalistic feelings and pro protectionism. So this is also another thing to keep in mind. And uh, maybe last highlights that uh, is interesting to note is the illegal immigrants and the fact that we are here in Italy. Last year, in 2014, more than 170,000 of illegal immigrants arrived to Italy, which is the largest influx into one country in the Euro history. If you look at this year, 2015, more than 40,000 migrants from Africa and West, and West Asia has been rescued. And this number, of course, continuing to go up day by day. And the question that follow, how to deal with this growing refugee crisis? Again, very interesting issues that our panel today will address them. So uh, today we have a panelist, international panelist covering different parts of the world. And we will be discussing this global mobility issue from different angles. We have uh, Dr. Dimitri Baba Dimitriou, President of uh, Migration Policy of an Institute of uh, Europe, MPI. Amy Nies, the Executive Director of Immigration Policy at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Nobuhiro Maeda, the Senior Analyst of NLI's Research Institution from Japan, and Ovis Sarmad, Chief of Staff at the International Organization of Migration, IOM, in Geneva. And last but not least, Stephen Cormier, the Secretary General of CBC CAF. As uh, housekeeping, uh, we are planning to have this session for a couple of hours. I have five speakers. Each one of them will talk for around 10 minutes. Then we will have a Q&A session. I'm trying to conclude at 12 o'clock. So allow me just to start introducing uh, the first speaker, Dr. Dimitrios Baba Dimitriou. He's a co-founder and president of the Migration Policy Institute Europe. He had published more than 270 books and articles and publications on migration and related issues and advises governments, officials, and uh, civil society organizations across the world in this important issue. Dimitri chairs the advisory board of the Open Society Foundation of International Migration Initiative. Dr. Dimitri will set the scene of the global changes in migration flows and why migration will continue to play a major role for nations and business leaders. What are the future trends and how can businesses and governments better prepare for the future changes? Dr. Dimitri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. It's still morning to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I thank the ICC for the invitation, and I'm honored to be on the panel with such distinguished uh, speakers. Um, what I want to do before I really start talking about the issue is say that there are two things that define international migration or mobility today. 
the first one is change, and the second one is complexity. I have done this, as you can tell from my lack of hair, and for the simple fact that I have never changed um, profession for a few years or decades. And I have never seen this issue change at the rate in which it is changing in the last few years. In fact, this change is so obvious, it literally happens in front of our eyes. Um, the wonderful, if complex, diagram that we were shown um, um, I mean, a few minutes ago by our chair. Mexico, indeed, is one of the largest places uh, in terms of bilateral migration, Mexico to the United States. But today, today, this year, Mexico has been surpassed by China and India as the main senders of immigrants to the United States. And there's this, the complexity of the issue also has very simple foundations within it. As Mexico is becoming increasingly a middle class society, both the urge to do what the previous generation did and the need for middle classes to have services and products of their own has, and of course, border enforcement on the part of the United States has made you know, Mexico into a place with which we're more likely to collaborate in the future rather than to have a difficult relationship because of migration. And complexity, everything is changing. The numbers that you heard a minute ago, which is gross numbers as to the overall size of the foreign born people in each country can actually be turned sideways, if not on their heads, if you were to look at, a, at the same numbers from a different perspective. If you were to look at what I call immigrant density, in other words, the proportion of foreign born in the population, all of a sudden the United States becomes sort of a middling place rather than the top place in the world. We have about 13.5% of our population that is foreign born, and that includes an excellent estimate of those people who are in the United States illegally. And there are other places, Sweden for instance, several places in the European Union, let alone all of the Gulf states, Luxembourg, probably dozens of places, Australia, Canada, that have one and a half to seven times as many foreign born in their midst. So here are the same figures. If you look at them differently, you realize that the picture changes. But let me say a few things about um, numbers and the headlines beyond that. Yes, there are about 230, 35, 40 million people who meet the UN definition of an immigrant, which is if you've stayed in your, outside of your country for more than a year, you get counted. You can imagine that that misses an awful lot of people who have not stayed outside of the, their country of birth for a year. And that's the most interesting part of the equation, at least when you think of it in terms of what may be troubling to many about these numbers. Those uncounted numbers, 25 to 50 million people, is a very significant number. Um, these are people who are in orbit. They, go from place to place, people who are uncounted as being illegally in a place. And in addition to these numbers, you have about 50 million people who are in need of protection. These are data from the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. And what you have among those 50 million is about 35 or so million who are um, uh, who are internally displaced, as we call them. They seek protection in their own country, but away from where the problem is. But there are about 14 or 15 million people who are outside of their country needing protection. And this is what Europe and the United States, but most importantly, the countries that are next to countries in trouble, the countries around Syria, 
parts of Africa, um, um, uh, parts of Central America and North America that actually have a real issue that they are trying to figure out what to do with this. And we are also getting to a point where some of the people who now have entered this sort of process of trying to find a place in which to move to, for some of these people, leaving their country has become a rite of passage. That's very important to remember because once something becomes a rite of passage, it's very difficult to change it. Typically, it takes about a generation before you can change it. Rite of passage, what do I mean by that? Once you become 16, 14, 15, 17, you're going to do what your brother did and what your father did 20 years ago and try to find a place in which to go, which creates an enormous issue uh, for the countries that are targeted, but from the human rights perspective, an even bigger issue in terms of the loss of life, the deprivations, all of the things that people suffer when they try to move illegally from their place of birth to elsewhere. elsewhere. But to get back to the main topic, we have now entered an age in which human capital is indeed the ultimate resource. I know that capital matters. I know that technology matters. I know that rules and regulations matter, but at the end of the day, success or relative failure depends very much on whether you have the right kind of human capital. By that, I mean people with the right education, skills, experiences that can help a firm to become more productive or more competitive, that can help innovate, and that it can actually help, ultimately, the country in which the firm is embedded to become more competitive in the global economy. And human capital appears, and this may be a surprise, at all possible levels. We typically focus on the high-end human capital, the desirable ones. You know, people, the you know, engineers and mathematicians and IT professionals, et cetera, et cetera, and that's fine. But that's the high end of the business. Hardly anyone objects to having more highly qualified people to come into a firm and to contribute toward the further development and success of the firm and indirectly the success of a country. But we also have needs at what I call the middle skills. In other words, people plugging in holes that firms have, people filling the steel gaps that firms have. Because in every society, in every economy, there will always be steel mismatches at the middle. And since most people work in the middle steels, and when you take demography into account, the biggest gaps are going to appear in the middle steels. But we also have very often gaps at the lower end, and the lowest end in particular. And the reason for that is much more complex. It's difficult to say very clearly, not in front of an audience like this, but in front of audiences full of activists, because the reason that we have gaps in that part, in the lowest end, is because there are always locational mismatches. In other words, you may have a surplus of labor in one part of a country, a shortage of labor in another one, unless you, somebody has found a way to just lift all of those folks and put them from one place to another, you will always have these issues. And there's also, and this is uh, you know, very real, but again, people don't always want to acknowledge it, a revolution of aspirations. In other words, people simply don't want their children, parents like us, don't want their children to do those jobs, almost regardless of who the parents are. And for, the, the last item on this is that some of these jobs are demanding, hard, often typically low paid, 
and sometimes dangerous. As a result, they go unfilled. So you can have, and this is you know, a difficult thing to explain, you know, politically at least. You can have, let's say, 14% unemployment in the country and real needs at the lowest end of the jobs continuum. And that is something that we need to continue to work hard on. More importantly, we are moving from the age of migration, which is what all of us probably understand here, which is people come, whichever way they settle, they have children, they work all of their lives, most of them will die in the place that they have moved to. In reality, this will continue. It will continue probably forever because it has, always, it has happened since the very beginning of time. But at the same time that we're continuing with the age of migration, we're moving into the age of mobility. Mobility being more temporary, back and forth, circular, and multi-step migration. And that part of migration is increasing in importance. Multi-step migration is when people spend a few years in country A, then they see a better opportunity in country B, and they move there for a few years. Um, they typically are younger people, may or may not have a family, and by the end of their professional lives, maybe they have settled somewhere, or more likely they have returned to their country of origin. So, this new age happens both because of our choices and preferences. We want the highly skilled, and the highly skilled are the most movable, like in every business. The ones with the most talent are the ones who have, who have the most opportunities. And also because of you know, their preferences they want to choose whatever it is that they want to do in their lives. And because we don't always want, as countries, to have many more lower skill people than we need to absolutely take in. So, and to move and stay for two minutes on the highly skilled, if I were to sort of come down to the very core of this, now already and in the future, talent rules. The most talented, and I, will be, I want to be provocative here in order for you to take this along with you, the most talented will decide where to go. More and more of them will decide where to go. Which means that the fundamental equation that has existed to date, which is we argue constantly in our countries as how do we choose them. That is now turning on its head and in the next 10 years, the most talented will change that equation into how do they choose us. This is really turns the entire equation on my, of migration and mobility on its head. And the choice of destination is not really nuclear science. Places that offer talent clusters and opportunities for people to make a big difference will win. Heavy, dense capital infrastructure, extremely attractive. Opportunity, more than extremely apartment. Remember, these are uh, 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 important. Remember, these are people who have invested heavily in themselves, have the skills, have the abilities, and they want to go to a place in which they can get the best returns in their own investments in themselves. And what else matters? It matters less, but it matters increasingly. They want to go to places that are tolerant, and embrace difference. And I want to emphasize that, embrace difference of all types. And this is something that we're gonna have to get better used to if we really want to continue to be clear and winning on this. And from a government perspective and from the perspective of the activities that chambers have to do, the lobbying, that they have to do in order to make sure that, that they do better, that they get the people that they need, 
the immigration package matters and matters alone. Clear rules, consistency of outcomes, treating families properly, meaning spouses being able to have employment rights, children that can go to school on an equal footing with the local kids, and increasingly important, skills recognition and credentials recognition. There is an awful lot of very talented people or middle talented people who move around the globe and unfortunately they have to be underemployed because their skills do not get recognized. I'll close with three general observations. The first one is we need to make a commitment today in this room, anywhere else for people who care about firms being able to get the people that they need in order to do better for themselves and the society around them. First one is do not waste human capital. Foreigners of all types, regardless, bring an awful lot of human capital with them. Some of them is formal, education, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Some of it some of it is informal, what we call tacit. Years of experience since we mentioned Mexico in the beginning. A Mexican who is a master builder in Mexico can build everything and anything, comes to, New, to, 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 to the United States and works putting up you know, drywalls in new buildings. That's a waste of human capital. And we need to really think of how to actually be able to recognize that and move them into a position where they can make the best contribution. The second one, Employers and countries must choose their foreign workers. It is employers who know what jobs are needed. It is employers that know what they have to invest in order to make their employees more successful and therefore their firms more successful. Let's move away from the tendency of some governments to think that they know better. We have such things as point systems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Thankfully, all of these systems now have moved in the direction where the employer and demand for labor is at the center of the selection of a worker. Finally, the most successful employers and firms will be those who continuously invest in their workers both nationals and foreign-born. This is the essence of competitiveness. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dimitri. And uh, as you just said, what Chambers should talk about and lobby for, this is what the subject of our next speaker, Amy Nies is the Executive Director on Immigration Policy at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. With the experience in the private practice of business immigration law for 23 years, she received the Presidential Awards from the American Immigration Lawyer Association based in her achievements and excellence. Amy graduated with honors from Tulane University with undergraduate degree in history and earned a law degree from George Washington University. Amy will share with us a presentation about restructuring U.S. immigration to improve economic growth, which is uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce prospective and immigration reforms. And of course, very important question whenever you think of U.S. and what's going on in U.S. is the immigration impact on American jobs. So many things to talk about. Amy, the podium of yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I'm very happy to be here and to participate in this panel. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's view on U.S. immigration. As uh, Dimitri talked about, certainly the businesses in the U.S. are very much of the view 
that the human capital needed by different firms, different industries, different sectors, different geographies across the United States is indeed what is going to drive um, our ability to improve our economy. The U.S. Chamber, for about 15 years, has been one of the leading voices in the United States pushing for immigration reform. The Friday before September 11th, uh, my boss, the president of the U.S. Chamber, along with Dimitri, the president of the AFL-CIO, were testifying before the Senate Immigration Committee, and we thought that immigration reform would soon happen. Then Tuesday, September 11th happened, and for good reason, the Congress was focusing on security and many other things. But still 15 years later, we have not been able to have a major rehaul of our immigration laws. The chamber, the U.S. chamber, has always believed that there are four elements of immigration reform. One is the security issues. Two is the need to modernize the legal immigration system. Three is to improve our uh, employment verification system so that employers, if they are required to verify um, and be penalized if they don't verify, the work authorization of all employees has a workable system. And four, um, as many of you know, we in the United States currently have somewhere on the order of 11 million individuals who live in the United States without authorization and somewhere between seven and eight million of those individuals work. About 60% of those people have resided in the United States for more than 10 years. So uh, we currently have a system that facilitates the ability of people to stay in our country indefinitely without authorization. So those are the four issues um, that we have always at the U.S. Chamber realized, buckets if you will, that there are need to be changes. But each of these areas has different stakeholders, different issues. They interlock with each other, and it's been very difficult to get uh, the Senate, the House of Representatives, and the administration of whatever president we have to agree on how to move, how to move forward. I want to just talk about the issue of modernizing the legal immigration system in the United States since as the U.S. Chamber, that's our primary focus, our primary area of expertise, and what our member companies across the United States um, need and rely on us to advocate for. So the current system, we very much believe, needs to address, uh, to facilitate changes at all skill levels. Unfortunately, even though it sounds logical, as Dimitri pointed out, that at the high end, there should be consensus that we want more um, highly educated and highly talented individuals if there are jobs that are not being filled with uh, U.S. workers. There's not consensus on that among our elected officials. So we need to change some of the high-skilled provisions, but also what we call lesser skilled um, at the chamber, meaning anything other than college educated, to include both the middle skilled and the low or unskilled. We need working visa programs in all these skill levels to allow both the temporary flow, which, uh, as Dimitri pointed out, sounds is going to be a change of more mobility and circular migration, as well as changing the ability of individuals to be able to stay in the U.S. In, uh, permanently, legally. The current immigration system in the United States for legal immigration involves caps that were set 25 years ago. Since then, our population has increased 30%. GDP has increased 2.8%. Uh, excuse me. <coughs> um, almost three times, over two and a half times. Um, and GDP per capita has increased almost 30%. But we still have the same caps. So we need to have flexibility built into these um, numerical limits. We also, if, I'm not sure that you know, but if you don't know that in the United States, we have no legal immigration opportunities for an individual who's either middle skilled or low skilled to come to the United States lawfully, except if you're an agriculture worker, but that system is so cumbersome and bureaucratic that employers don't use it. 
So we need to have, we say, a peg on the pegboard so that when uh, legal, so there is a means for legal workers to come into the United States at all skill levels. One of the things that the U.S. Chamber is dealing with this year in 2015 is a growing sort of campaign among certain groups and certain senators that, in fact, all we need to do to help U.S. workers is lower, restrict the number of immigrants and that jobs would just free up for Americans. This uh, is a myth and the fact is that uh, foreign uh, workers in the U.S. Um, increase U.S. productivity um, at the high end, it, science, technology, and engineering, and math workers, uh, professionals, STEM professionals, economists have looked into this and determined that um, over the last, or during the 20 year period, 1990 to 2010, probably 10 to 25% of the productivity in the United States can be uh, traced directly to foreign born STEM professionals working in the US. Most of these individuals attend US universities and graduate with US degrees, but the way our system works, there's not a straightforward method for those individuals to um, remain in the United States. Again, at all skill levels, we believe that uh, foreign workers, when they are coming to the US to fill jobs that aren't being filled by Americans, actually help create jobs for Americans. Uh, at the uh, lesser skilled end, there's studies that show that for each legal temporary foreign worker, 4.64 additional jobs are created for Americans. For um, the high skilled side of things, for each legal foreign worker entering the United States, 1.83 additional new jobs are created for Americans. And when we allow individuals who have a U.S. master's or doctorate degree from a U.S. institution in the sciences, technology, engineering, or math to remain in the U.S., each one of those individuals helps to create 2.62 additional jobs for Americans. But we are dealing as the U.S. Chamber with a number of myths. Another one is that currently we should be afraid in the United States that 20% of all jobs are being filled by, quote, foreign workers. Now, um, as Dimitri hinted at, one of the things that happens in this space, and probably in a lot of other areas, is that different institutions, government entities, um, international organizations use different definitions for different points. But in the US, we would like, at least as the US Chamber, we would like there to be a focus on the fact that if you're a foreign born naturalized American citizen, you're not taking a job away from an American, you are an American. And we need to stop talking about those individuals as being quote, foreign born workers. The facts are that 91.4% of all jobs in America are filled by American citizens, according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. And that, that remaining 8.6% includes 13 million lawful permanent residents of the United States, green card holders. And so the idea of um, putting fear in the uh, eyes of the voters or in other members of Congress is, uh, again, another one of those myths. On the lesser skilled side, the unskilled and lesser skilled side of things, which again, as the chamber, we include also middle skilled jobs. Anything lesser, lower than a college degree um, where there are visa programs for those individuals, that these lesser skilled immigrants take jobs away from Americans who do not have a college education. But while many um, social scientists and economists have done research expecting to find that, um, the research doesn't bear it out. And as Dimitri said, on the many of the lesser skilled, the lower skilled occupations, these are jobs that grease the economy, they're hard work, 
um, sometimes dangerous jobs, and that some economists who have looked at different uh, cities across the United States have found that actually the cities that have the greater number of lesser skilled immigrants experience lower unemployment rates. Again, bolstering that idea that um, immigrants help create jobs for Americans by doing jobs that actually Americans aren't interested or available to do. Um, when, when immigrants come to the United States, some organizations like the Brookings Institution have uh, assessed that there's over 100 metropolitan economies of different sizes across the United States where immigrants tend to uh, reside. Um, you can compare this to Canada where 80% of all immigrants in Canada um, settle in three cities, three very large cities. So we have quite a diversity um, built into the U.S. immigration system. That's one of the reasons why it makes it hard to figure out where the compromises should be because there's so many different fact patterns and so many different ways that immigrants um, are assimilated into our uh, local communities. But this idea that less educated Americans are somehow threatened by less skilled immigrants doesn't bear out in the actual research. Um, this has been studied not only by economists but also by different leading African American studies um, scientists, social scientists, presuming that they would find a sizable negative uh, effect on the wages and employments of lesser skilled Americans, um, but they just have not been able to find those actual results. Um, I would like to just uh, end on this point of the different, to emphasize the point of the different skill levels. In other words, it's not just the high skilled, it's also the uh, lesser skilled, including the middle and low skilled workers. In our US Bureau of Labor Statistics, the most recent data, um, it's always two years behind. So 2012 to 2022 um, report was in 2014, the end of 2014 that the highest, some of the highest growth occupations that we're gonna see in our economy are jobs that do not require um, college, university education. And just for example, in a country um, where we in the US are starting to face some of the similar demographics that some of other countries are, um, like our colleague from Japan who will probably talk about this, if we have an aging population in the US we expect that there's gonna be a 48% growth in the need for personal care aids and home health care aids, excuse me. <coughs> but current unemployment for US born US citizens in those occupations is only 2.9%, which is considered near full employment as you know. So having immigrants helps to fill these um, gaps in our economy. This, it's an example of the skill gaps. So, we, as the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, um, are very active in trying to uh, push Congress um, and the federal agencies to change immigration policies in the U.S. to be more flexible and reflective of the changing uh, dynamics so that in the future um, we can have a system that anticipates and allows uh, economic indicators to control the number and type of workers um, that come into the United States. And um, we, uh, both on our US Chamber website, uschamber.com backslash immigration, and we also have a special separate immigration website, immigration.uschamber.com. We have information about the US Chamber's positions and articles and studies and so forth. Um, and. Uh, I'll close there and look forward to hearing the rest of the presentations and having a question and answer session with you all. Thank you, Amy. So this is an example how chambers of commerce can contribute to this important subject. Going forwards, we will move from US to Japan and uh, it's interesting to note that Japan is the most aging society in the world. They have a population of around 130 million, and only less than 2% of this population are immigrants. This is the opposite of maybe countries like United Arab Emirates. 
And of course, there is less than 1% of the Japanese live outside Japan. So we have our next speaker, Mr. Nobohiro Maide. He is specialized in gero, geronto, gerontology. This is a word I didn't know about before, so I Googled it, and I found out there is actually a specialized field which is about aging. Aging, or we put it in a different way, maturity and wisdom, and uh, the challenges of old society. So this is a very interesting, specialized, Mr. Nobohiro is an expert and researcher of social improvements and life design at NLI Research Institute in Japan. He's also a visiting researcher at the Institute of Gerontology in, uh, as part of University of Tokyo. He issued a number of publications, has a bachelor degree from School of Commerce at the Waseda University and MBA degree from Nihon University Graduate School of business, Mr. Nobuhiro will talk about global mobility in Japan and the future perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Nobuhiro Maeda. I came from Japan and uh, I'm from NLI Research Institute and the University of Tokyo. Uh, thank you for inviting me to such an important symposium today. I talked to you about the um, uh, current status and future prospects of global mobility in Japan. I say to you first, but I'm poor at English. Uh, so please allow me to read the um, manuscript in my pre uh, presentation. At first, I introduce about Japan. As you all know, Japan is the island, island country. Uh, population is large, although the uh, country is small. Uh, this picture uh, Mount Fuji, Mount Fuji, uh, big city Tokyo, uh, a famous scramble intersection in Shibuya and Kyoto. <laughs> well, the foreigners in Japan are very few. They are only 1.6%. There are many people from uh, China and South Korea, um, uh, Philippines, and Brazil, and Brazil, uh, the other. On the other hand, uh, there are also few Japanese who reside overseas. Uh, they are only 0.9%. Uh, there are many people who live in the United States and China uh, and Australia, uh, United Kingdom, and Canada, uh, the other. Uh, Japan is a developing country in respect of global mobility. So far, not enough policy, academic research, and discussion have been conducted. Uh, global mobility is just an administration matter and a justice uh, ministry. No delayed, uh, detailed discussion is down. No, dis no detailed discussion is down. Uh, however, the situation has changed. As you all know, Japan is a super aged and low birth rate uh, society. And 
depopulating a society. The next three, that global mobility expands certainly, and expectations are growing too. I talk about the background uh, briefly. Briefly, uh, Japan is the most aging society in the world. Uh, Japan is a frontrunner of super-aged country society. Uh, this is a population pyramid. In Japan, one in three people uh, becomes an elderly person by 2030. The population began to decrease from 2008 by a decline in the number of births and aging in Japan. The wealth force also continues decreasing. Uh, there are many issues among Japan. Uh, Japan is an um, important stage whether or not we are able to build the hopeful, hopeful future. Uh, clear challenges stand in front of us. Uh, we are proceeding steadily in search of solution uh, for the issues. Uh, in such a session, I talk about global mobility in future Japan. The first stretch, uh, first solution over the subject of a decrease in population is the social particip participation of elderly people and women. The next is an immigration policy. A basis of the Japanese immigration policy is selective immigration policy. Uh, however, the selective immigration policy is at selfish discretion of the government. Um, important thing is to create the society uh, which gets young overseas person to come. I think that maintenance of the, of the environment which promotes global mobility is the most important. Ah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, the Tokyo Olympic Games uh, will be held in 2020. And the implement to promote active participation of Japanese people to being created. Uh, however, in case of Japan, uh, there are three issues. When these things and concurred, uh, global mobility doesn't advance. Uh, first, the biggest problem is language. Uh, many Japanese do not uh, speak English. Uh, on the other hand, Japanese is a um, very difficult language for foreigners. Uh, second, the public system is not fully English friendly, although there has been some progress in recent years. A third, I think that the sense of values which accepts diversity is spreading. Uh, however, some people are exclusive. In 
conclusion, though there are uh, these issues, I think that the environment for global mobility is improving step by step uh, towards the future. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everything. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Nowadays, when we talk about the subjects, we can't stop or think, stop, we can't stop thinking about the irregular migration. With everything going on in the war, in the world, actually, with the war in Syria and the conflict in Libya, the faces of migrants is all over the news. And the large scale of irregular migrants have challenged the global community in effective border management. So how does society deal with these challenges? Our next speaker, Ova Sarmat, Chief of Staff at the IOM, will tell us more about that. He has hands-on experience in the fields with uh, spending time in Philippines, UK, and India. And one of his recent one being uh, chief of mission at Manila. He, was, he will talk about responding to the challenge of a humanitarian crisis and irregular migration. Salmat. Good morning, and uh, I start with thanking the organizers, the chambers uh, uh, of Glo uh, the Chambers Con Congress, and the organizers, and the distinguished participants here. A uh, very quick introduction to who I represent. My name is Ove Sarmad, and I uh, represent the International Organization for Migration, which is a 65-year-old organization, multilateral global organization dealing with migration, uh, the only leading organization in the world that has that mandate. And we have about 450 offices around the world, 9,000 staff uh, implementing various migration activities in various fields, so we know a few things about uh, migration and human mobility. Uh, I've been asked to talk about irregular migration and uh, in the context of global human mobility, but before I start that, what I want to highlight is and uh, share with you my personal view about migration and human mobility is that we must remember that we are talking about human, human beings. And uh, migration is uh, about human mobility, as was already highlighted by different panelists. And migrants, as humans, have feelings, emotions, rights, expectations, ambitions, and above all, respect and uh, uh, respect for dignity. And we must remember that. We must uh, make sure that that is taken into consideration. The uh, scene has already been set in terms of various statistics about migration, what uh, the global mobility is uh, all about, and what the world is facing in terms of migration. My presentation is about forced migration, irregular migration, migration that happens uh, in not so uh, ideal circumstances. So I'd like to emphasize three points. One is, first of all, we must understand the global trends involving crisis and irregular migration. Second, that migration, uh, managing irregular migration must be done through a high road scenario, and I'll explain that, what I mean about, about it. And then the final point is we should go beyond just saving lives. Saving lives is extremely important. That is the center of uh, the human uh, dignity factor that I mentioned, but we need to also look at other values and avenues for migration. So the first point in terms of global trend, we in our organization believe that we are living in an unprecedented times uh, involving human mobility. There are more people on the, on the move in this world today than ever before. One in seven person in the world of seven billion population is in some form of migratory 
process. Uh, those statistics have already been shared. And within that, as already was uh, highlighted by Mr. Dimitrio, 50 million people are affected by conflict to migrate. And this is the largest since the Second World War that uh, we have seen. This is due to increased number of simultaneous and complex emergencies that you see every day in the uh, television and the newspapers uh, from various parts of Africa to South Asia to Sy Syria, Afghanistan, Libya, Yemen, South Sudan, and Ebola crisis and other uh, communicable diseases. In addition to those, as was already highlighted, 22 million people are displaced by natural disasters. So we also see, in the context of all of that, a vacuum in political leadership, an ethical and moral value leadership, which is absent from the international discussion, international dialogue. And we also see a huge anti-migrant sentiment. Now, you must have seen uh, re recent news reports coming out of Hungary the government promoting uh, anti-migrant sentiment and narrative which is extremely dangerous. As a result, we also witness a decrease in public confidence in governments, the public confidence in government's ability to manage migration and linked with these disasters and their own countries and business requirements. All of these elements compel people to migrate under less than ideal situations or circumstances. To illustrate, some 220,000 irregular migrants arrived in Europe by crossing the Mediterranean last year. This year, our organization has already recorded 88,000 landings in Italy, Greece, Malta, and Spain. Whether land or sea, these migrants have left a trail of tears. Victims of criminal gangs or smugglers have tortured, extorted, and dehumanized their plight. These travel agents of death, as we refer to them, have killed almost 2,000 migrants this year alone. Now, what do we need then? We need a high road scenario. As I explained, migration and human mobility is about emotions, it's about expectations, it's about human dignity. That cannot all, all be put together in some sort of le legislation, laws, or practices. We need a high road scenario. And what is that high road scenario? In a high road scenario, our first priority must be to save lives, to respect uh, human, uh, hu human lives, and to protect the rights of migrants. If migrant lives are saved and respected, then there is an entire range of alternatives that are available, which are, for instance, if migrants find themselves in an irregular situation, they should, should, they should be assisted to go back to the countries of origin in a voluntary and a dignified manner. There should be a capacity building to manage migration at all levels of the society. Uh, there should be a very strong effort to arrest and prosecute smugglers and traffickers. There should be proper controls to manage humanitarian border management, public edu education, awareness, and information campaigns should be in uh, instituted across the board. And as already was pointed out by Mr. Dimitrios, more migration alternatives should be put forward, such as humanitarian visas, pr temporary protection visas, or status, short-term visas, circular migration, and temporary relocation or eventually resettlement in different countries. But these are all state-led functions. But what I would like to highlight are ways in which private sector, the chambers, can support and alleviate human suffering and boost economies, which brings me to my final and third point, which is about addressing the root causes and going beyond just saving lives. We have an opportunity to provide people with an option aside from irregular migration. Increasing legal and safe avenues for regular migration in the region, in different regions of the world, will take the wind out of the sails of smugglers and traffickers. The private enterprises that you all represent, 
should provide alternatives. This can be achieved by facilitating more avenues for labor migration, which helps decrease irregular migration, reducing the human and financial cost of migration. As we all know, immigration policies often favor migrants who are highly skilled. The question now is then, who are these highly skilled migrants? Are those with postgraduate degrees or those with long professional experience? What about entrepreneurs? A 2013 study conducted over seven years found that the native Europeans are more likely to upgrade to more skilled and better paid occupations when flexible labor markets facilitate the entry of more immigrants, as was also highlighted by one of the fellow panelists. So many migrants establish small-scale industries themselves. Unfortunately, many skilled migrants who would be able to create jobs would not pass the so-called highly skilled category. And these criteria do not also tell us how a particular migrant would fare. Migrants who have experienced tremendous hardship appreciate very much the precious opp opportunity they have been given to resettle in a more peaceful and prosperous nation. Employers report that they seek resilience, adaptability, intellectual agility, and versatility in their workers, qualities that many migrants possess. So we need to find ways to match those two sides. The answer, therefore, is not to focus exclusively on high-skilled migrants, but implement measures to allow all nationals and migrants, including refugees and asylum seekers, to fulfill their potential <clears throat> and thereby make the best of the resident talent. Another very important point is to reduce the cost of migration. Now, what do I mean by that? The migrants pay a huge amount of money to migrate in some instances. And we as international community businesses need to intervene and reduce those costs. One is before the migration happens through ir 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 irregular or uh, illegal recruiters who charge a huge amount of money to uh, recruit and mig uh, migrants and transfer them to different countries. In IOM, we have uh, implemented something referred to as IRIS, which is the International Recruitment Integrity System, which ensures that recruiters are judged by certain standards, and they do not then exploit the migrants who are looking for a better future or opportunity in different parts of the world. A linked area, which is facilitating clear and cost-effective visa processing, that is another very important process is to bring the visa processing closer to the migrants from where they migrate from and ensure that their documentation, skills recognition are uh, uh, properly uh, verified and uh, respected before and after they migrate. Another very important cost-reducing me reducing measure is about remittances. Remittances, as we know, globally, it's reported to be about $25 billion. That's a huge amount. And m different money houses char charge about 5 to 10% in transferring that amount from one part of the uh, world to the other. Now, we are very much engaged in trying to reduce that percentage to below 5%, which would mean that that savings would be put to good use in terms of development and helping different countries to better uh, improve their economic situation. In conclusion, our organization has advocated and actively supported a holistic migration policy approach, one that recognizes that migration is now and it will be a mega trend of the century. Our thesis or narrative is that migration is inevitable owing to the demography and other realities. It is necessary if skills are to be available, jobs to be filled, and nations to flourish, and desirable if well managed through sensible, humane, and responsible policies. 
The logical conclusion, therefore, is that migration is not a problem to be solved, but a reality to be managed. I would like to leave with few thoughts that the chambers, what chambers can do in addressing this phenomenon. They can play a, crit a critical and a pivotal role in demystifying the human mobility narrative, which is, and I repeat, that migration and human mobility is inevitable, it is necessary, and it is desirable if well managed. And let's not forget about who we're talking about. We're talking about humans, and that requires a dignified, orderly, safe, and humane way of managing migration for all concerned. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Last but not least, we have uh, Stephen Cormier. Cormier is the Secretary General of the Permanent Conference of African and French Chamber, CBC CAF. He served previously as the Chief of Staff to the Presidents and CEO of Paris Chamber of Commerce, and uh, he's a graduate of history and has MA in law and graduated with executive MBA from HEC. Uh, Stephen will talk about the African perspective and ensuring a country has the necessary skills for the developments of its uh, economy, migration and immigrations are high proper priorities on the agenda of many nations. How can the economies in Africa react and work together to ensure economic progress building sustainable future, peace, and prosperity. Stephen, the panel is yours. Thank you, Chairman. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, I have to apologize my president, uh, who should have been there today, but he has had to cancel his flight, so that's why of my presence, so all my regrets for that. Uh, few words about CPCCAF. CPCCAF, to, to explain it quickly, is a, 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 a groupment of a Chamber of Commerce, of Agriculture, of Arts and Craft from 29 countries, 25 in Africa, and uh, has been created in 1973 by three presidents, on the demand of three presidents, Leopold Sédar Senghor of Senegal, uh, Félix oufouet boigny of Ivory Coast, and Georges Pompidou uh, of France. And uh, the main goal was to uh, foster the economic development between Africa and Francophone countries as to uh, strengthen the private African private sector. It's still the same goals. We are still there 42 years after. It has been created with the help of the Chamber of Commerce of Paris, which is still there as well. So Africa and migration and development, it's a really crucial subject because we have to bear in mind three main points. But if you have to keep one image of what is happening in Africa, it's the image of the cooker pressure. You saw the machine? And this cooker pressure has no valve today, and that's quite a problem. Uh, first of all, what we have to, 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 to know is uh, that Africa is experiencing a real demographic revolution, unique in the world. Since the First World War, uh, the African growth is the story of a demographic catch-up, which has increased the continent's population from 100 million to 1 billion in around 100 years. It's a factor 10 already. And for the near future, the minimal growth will be to 1.8 billion in 2050, which will be on 150 years, a factor 18. Uh, the figures did not say that much, but if I say that with such a growth in Europe, we will be actually 2 billion compared to the 700 billion, uh, million we are, and will be 4.5 billion in 2050, you can immediately, uh, immediately sorry, perceive the human, the economic, and the social consequences that the African continent will soon face. Second point, it's this demographic pressure is reinforced by multiple challenges. First one, the political, military, religious crisis. You just talked about a uh, few minutes ago, but everyone today is aware of 
the, the religious and political turmoil in the Sahel. And this mechanically creates tension on the population who, of course, seek to leave this crisis area. But it has been the case before. In the Darfur, in the Gulf of Guinea, in the Great Lakes region, you have to, 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 to know that there have been 8 million people who died in 10 years in the 90s there. So there is no other answer than migration for these people. The food challenge, it's, uh, an example is worth an explanation. Niger, not Nigeria, Niger, is inhabited by 15.15 million people living for 80% of them from the livestock and agriculture, with only 15% of arable land. This country is already under pressure of food. But people from Niger will be 46 million in 20 or 30 years. There is no productivity gains, which by itself should allow in such a short time to ensure the country's food self-sufficiency. So it's the same in many countries in Africa. Another factor is the climate change. It's uh, IPCC uh, experts, which are quite serious, indicate that by 2080, 1.2 billion persons in Africa will be exposed to water stress, 600 million by hunger, 2 million to 7 million more per year to coastal flooding. See, so no need to say, and even with a margin of error of 70%, that the migration will be intensified on the mainland. And at last, economy and employment. Historically, the economic migrations were important to Africa, to work, to feed. Mozambicans and Zimbabweans in South Africa, Burkina Faso people in Ivory Coast, Sub-Saharan in Maghreb, all these employment areas welcome immigrants throughout African history. But with the successive and recent economic crisis, we have witnessed xenophobic out uh, outbreaks in Africa, blocking those ancestral processes. Furthermore, the situation will become even harder with the influx of the young people in search of jobs, around 20 million per year from 2030, when the market can just absorb up to 10 million. These young are urban, underemployed, connected, informed, and wherever this youth will be, she will seek to build for itself a better life. So she will move. To meet this challenge, the valves I have just talked about at the beginning of the past have more or less disappeared. The problem of the African population are facing today is that their continent is more or less close to the other one, but mostly to itself. African continent has always been a continent of migration, always, overwhelmingly domestic. It is worth remembering that the total share of African migrants, including North Africa, to OECD countries is around 10% today, to compare to the 17% of Asian migrants or the 25% of Latin American migrants. So the African invasion is rather a myth than a reality. But the migration policies that are implemented globally are strongly slowing the migration movement, which is a new fact in the history of the world. The share of migrants in the early century was 5% compared to the 3% we just heard a few minutes ago. But even more important, the continent is especially close to itself due to the recent application of the national borders. Those borders, purely formal, inherited from 1885, uh, though formal for decades, became real those last years and blocked the internal migrations, even though they are essential to regulate the needs of the populations. So the picture I've just drawn is intended to be objective, not pessimistic. It is urgent, collectively, to undertake radical changes in our joint approach to development. If not, the African continent and its neighbors will face with very severe social tensions. The problem is ours. It's not me who is saying that. It's Mr. Juncker last week in the European Development Days. So, first necessary easing the migration rules. This topic is now high on the agenda of the African and Euro-African policy. As a proof, the declaration of heads of state of the EU-African summit on the 3rd April 2014, and the common position of the Ameri African Union on migration and development. So I hope that the rule will relax necessar necessarily with Af within Africa and between Africa and the rest of the world to allow the necessary flexibility for an optimum allocation of people and employment. Last week, 
uh, Mr. Juncker uh, in the European Development Days demand to the head of states of Europe uh, an easing of these rules. By now, it's not acquired. This phenomenon of migration from Africa to, to Europe mainly will be reinforced by the European air call caused by the decline of the working age population, which is not just in Japan, but in Europe as well. That is to be 23% between 2010 and 2050. If Europe wants to maintain its competitiveness, overcome the lack of workforce, and continue to finance its social model, there is a safe bet that the need of workers will change the opinion on the African immigration. But it should not be, and it's maybe the most important point of this topic, at the expense of the African development, which will be the best answer to the situation. If you look closely to the figures, you will see that the rate of the highly skilled migrants is much greater than the total immigration rate. In 2010-2011, Burundi, Lesotho, Malawi, Maldives, Mozambique, Namibia, Niger, Tanzania, Zambia, the immigration rate of highly qualified people represent more than 20 times the total rate of immigration in these countries. It is therefore not primarily the poor migrants, but the educated ones that are migrated. Be migrating, sorry. And this is a worrying phenomenon in all sectors that are lacking of experienced people. If you look at the number of doctors in Portugal, there are the double number of, of Angolese doctors in Portugal than in Angola. In France, there is around 200,000 uh, 200, doctors. There is 100,000 in Africa. But there is the same number of Senegalese doctors in France than in Senegal. Second axis, the African development. It seems absolutely necessary to rebalance the labor market to enable it to operate more efficiently. Rebalance means creating the conditions for job-creating growth by influencing the competitiveness of African economies, which has, which has great assets, a big market, natural resources. Two levers have to be fostered to promote such jobs, allowing international deployment of African industrial champions by improving their competitiveness and encourage new businesses and jobs in SMEs. The cost of factors of production in Africa is very high and penalizes the companies in global competition. High indirect costs such as electricity, transportation, communication, security, corruption form a larger part than elsewhere of the cost of the companies. It's necessary to give to the African businesses the means to fight on equal terms against the competition and create an inclusive growth. For SMEs, which account for the majority of the private sector jobs, it is urgent to facilitate their work, improving the business climate and sparking vocation to help young people to create their own jobs before creating those of others. Within the CPCCAF, we have committed a series of actions to find and remove this obstacle to the development of SMEs while promoting the development of trade between our continents. Because we believe, like you, that our organization may bring by the action some of the answers to structure the local economic development and the strengthening of trade in general. Thank you very much. Okay. I think, uh, let me see the mics. Can we switch on the mics? All right. You can hear him. Good. All right, now we'll come to the second part of uh, this uh, discussion. So we will shift, uh, I will say, the rights to you to ask us instead of going from this direction to you. So we have uh, microphones in uh, all aisles. If you have any question, please uh, raise your hand, state your name, your organization, and also if you can direct it to which speakers. And I would like you also to keep the question short if possible, and let's stick with the questions instead of comments. So we have the first one here in the front row. We'll come back to you. Well, good morning. Yeah, this is Ahmed Najim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is Ahmed Najim from the GCC Arbitration Center. Well, the, the topic is very essential, we know. But we have a different problem in our region, what we call it the fugitive workers that are legally coming to our countries, but they are not lifting our countries legally. 
So it affects the economy. Everybody knows that the, the, the manpower, I mean, skills or the manpowers uh, affect the economy. Okay. So, and, and we did, as, as a Chamber of Commerce, we under a lot of uh, reforms in solving this problem. And we depend a lot on the Asians' workers or employment. So I want just to focus that our area or our regions, we don't have this problem as we call it, the, the immigrants, but we have the fugitive workers who stay in our country for a long time, longer than the legal time they have to stay. Okay. So how this uh, will affect the economy in the GCC countries? Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, do you have any specific panelists? Or anyone. Sarma, do you want to take that? It's, uh, okay. Uh, now this was an in interesting question. Thank you very much for uh, putting a very important point across uh, with regard to, if I understand your question correctly, it's about migrants who overstay their legal duration and how does that affect the economy? Is that, is, is that the right question? Well, as I, as I explained, first and foremost, we need to recognize that these are human beings. We need to treat them with digni dignity uh, and, and humane ways of dealing with their plight, why they are there in the first instance, and how they can be uh, assisted. From IOM's experience, what we believe strongly is to give them an opportunity to return back voluntarily. And there are many programs that can assist these workers who have come to a particular country, overstayed, and find themselves in an irregular situation. Give them opportunities, and these are very well established voluntary return programs that IOM has in many different uh, parts of the world. With a little bit of reintegration support, they can go back, start small businesses, get further education, and re-establish uh, re themselves in the countries from where they originated from, and prevent and uh, communicate their experience and stories in their communities so that there they, they will be no further irregular migration. And that's what we would strongly recommend. Because any other, th any other measure which is addressing from a security point of view, we believe is not going to be, be appropriate and does not help the matter. Okay, thank you. You want to elaborate further? Dimitri? Yes. Uh, I can hear you. Okay. So, um, thank you for your question. Um, I think that it goes to the very core of the issue. All of those things that we've discussed here, greater mobility, uh, you know, the unavoidability of more migration, et cetera, et cetera, hinge on a statement that you made. The important issues is not, or the important statements are not unavoidable or necessary or desirable. It is if well managed. Correct. Okay? You're, point, you're pointing directly to if well managed. And I, you know, I know that there are nice ways of doing it, but fundamentally what undermines belief in the system, what causes this, you know, lack of trust between the governed and the government, what creates virtually all the problems that we have on migration is that we do not focus on the fact that in order for migration to give us all the benefits that it can give us, it has to be legal, it has to be orderly, and it has to be safe. And we all understand what these words mean. You're pointing on the illegality. We have all pointed to the safety issue, you know, people dying in the process. But we haven't really focused on orderliness. Orderliness is a systematic way in which firms can access the labor that they need, the workers that they need. Anything outside of those three concepts will eventually become a problem for our societies. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll take uh, another question. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Emmanuel Blahoyanis, the Saloniki Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, member of uh, WCF uh, Global Council. Uh, if I have correctly understood, Mr. Papadimitriou made a remarkable statement uh, that it is up to employers and employees to decide which will be the structure of uh, the workforce and which will be uh, the flows of the migration necessary to sustain this uh, level of workforce. Since it is reflect, I agree with this, since it reflects a basic uh, conception of free markets. But the problem is not that, if I agree or not. The problem is that most European constituencies especially do not agree with that. Uh, and the problem is that these or European uh, constituencies to uh, shape with their uh, voting the government's behavior. And I suspect that uh, th this, this uh, kind of attitudes, although not uh, supported by, by proper data, lie in the fact that people in, in Europe are becoming loss aversive, and they are loss aversive. And probably uh, this is due to uh, an architecture of uh, welfare state that is overextended. And if it is overextended, people do uh, have uh, fears that um, inflow <coughs> of immigrants can alter their prosper, uh, prosperity. And uh, this is the way constituencies uh, shape their attitudes, and this is the way governments reflect to the constituencies. How we can solve this problem? Thank you. All right. Dimitri. Th yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. It's a very good question. Um, and I'm totally aware, since an awful lot of my work is in Europe, I'm totally aware of the reactions to migration. But I will go to where I was a minute, a minute and a half ago, which is the part of orderly. I did not suggest, you know, that you have some sort of a global system where employers decide whom they want and these people just come in. You do this within prescribed rules. Those rules are set by government, which in reality <coughs> means that they are set by the society. So orderliness is identifying a real need, certifying it, it doesn't have to be individual by individual, and then opening the labor market to accommodate that need. Perfect examples, two from Europe. Germany, until 2011, Germany resisted pretty much any opening to migration. Employers did not organize themselves. Employers, particularly large employers, tend to be very shy about <laughs> going you know, front and center on a difficult issue like this. They organized, um, and Germany opened up to migration that responds to labor market needs. And this year, I don't know whether it's 2.15 or 2.14, Germany was the second largest net immigration country in the world. Can you imagine this? I know you know it, but can you imagine this, you know, from a country that constantly resisted greater opening to immigration to being only second to the United States in terms of net migration. That is an orderly, systematic way of opening migration. And there are many other examples throughout Europe, let alone the United States. You know, I didn't argue for, you know, some sort of a eliminate rules or, you know, having some sort of a global governance system. I argued for having immigrants meet specific demands, need, uh, uh, and the demands are employer-driven. They know where the jobs are, what jobs they need. No government can substitute for an employer in that regard. Sarma, do you want to comment more? Very quickly. Uh, again, thank you very much for the question and uh, to compliment what Mr. Dimitri said. One recent example that I wanted to share with you is I was recently in China uh, in an event organized by the China Globalization Center. 
and I was absolutely amazed uh, listening to what China is doing. China took 600,000 high-skilled migrants last year, and they refer to as high-end migration. And in a very orderly, systematic, and in a deliberate fashion, because this is to do with one, China is also catching up in terms of its aging society. They're not finding uh, those high-skilled uh, workers in the Chinese economy, so they're, therefore they're attracting uh, high-end labors from different parts of the world, and they're doing it in a very intelligent and a systematic manner, and that's what we call orderly way of attracting labor, and those countries who provide those kind of facilities will flourish, and those businesses will fl flourish, and this is China's way of globalizing their businesses, their economy, to compete at an international level. Okay, Emmy? I, I just also wanted to add to the uh, part of your question about how do we actually achieve this, because as businesses, we see that employer-driven process will result in the right types of immigrants, but uh, there's not a common ground consensus among everyone that that is comfortable. And so my thought on that, and something that we talk a lot about trying to foster on the U.S. side is, instead of trying to focus on where there's common ground, we have to be committed to solving the problem. So mm. let's sit down and compromise, because there's not one answer. But if in our, each of our societies there's a commitment to solve the problem, we can compromise. That doesn't mean that we have to agree and have common ground on all of the, what is that specific system going to be? How, what is the orderly way to start out with? We just have to agree that we have to try to solve the problem. So we try to think of that too. Excellent. So we have a question on this side. All right. So let him, okay, ladies first. Okay, good morning. <laughs> Let's take the lady first. Sorry. So first of all, I introduce myself. My name is Khadr Mohammed. I came from Somalia. I represent Jubaland Chamber of Commerce. As you know, Somalia has become a federal regional status. And as you know, everyone now is going to Mogadishu only. First of all, you have to know Mogadishu is northern Somalia. And the <coughs> richest region is Jubaland. Jubaland represents three regions. That it has the biggest river, uh, agriculture resource, fisheries, and uh, uh, livestock. Okay. So that is uh, my introduction. Other way, I have come to England 1991. I settled there for 22 years. I thank the United Kingdom that they was helpful for Somali communities. They offer us to study, to have our business, and we see the flood of business as a showbiz, a centuries, everything. And also they offer the people that have not education to give them education. They create SL classes to give them to learn English. Other way, uh, after 22 years, I came back to Somalia. Now three years, I'm working with Somali community. I set up two company. That is, one is trading and construction, and the other one is fishing. The other one, I am member of the chamber of community of the region. Okay, J just for the sake of time, can you tell, ask the question? Only the question that I want to do, just yeah. was, I'm doing introduction. Okay. My question is how to stop the immigration. As you know, I, our younger generation, they died in the sea between Yemen and Somalia for two centuries. So when we, I went there, I did research why they are going from the country. They have no job. They have no chance to study. So if we create a factories, they can have job. They can be settled. Okay. That uh, is the question, how to stop. Yeah, the, uh, another one, the investors always, we are listening to that, 
they are giving to Somalia millions and millions of dollars. Where this money is going? We have to redirection to the field of the economical okay. field. I, I, I get your question. So this is also discussing the point of not only advanced economies or countries of destinations is stopping, but also some countries such as Somalia. Maybe uh, it's, it's maybe it's a better idea for the countries of origin to keep their resources. Mm -hmm. So what do you want to say, Stephen, in this <laughs> from African uh, perspective? Yeah. Thank you for the question. Thank you. I, I think you can block people, okay. but you can try to. Uh, it's a cost for the, the African countries to lose their high skilled people because they formed them and then they flew away. Uh, so there is just one uh, solution is development, auto development. Okay. And for this, we have to uh, reinforce our head. I, I just remind, uh, remember for everyone that uh, we have not reached yet the 0 0.7 uh, percent of the total GDP of the world in the head. We are below 0 0.5. So there is no real other solution than the head, the money from the diaspora, and the African states to try to uh, uh, fight against corruption and try to, 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 to install good governance. But it's a wide program. All right, I appreciate that. For the sake of time, let's be specific with the questions, please, and instead of making comments, because we have 10 more minutes. Thank Go you, ahead. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mehdi al Mazen from Dubai Chamber of Commerce. Uh, my question is to Mr. Nobuhiro. Uh, what are the actions and steps taken by the Japanese companies in response uh, to develop their markets in response of uh, an aging population? Thank you, Mehdi. Okay. Thank you for your question. I uh, let me uh, speak in Japanese, then translate. I will translate into English. First, talking about Japanese economic situation, we had a long period of deflation, but because of the abenomics, you know, our Japanese economy has finally started to pick up. Maybe for outsiders, you know, Japanese aging uh, society, it is something that you are, you feel uh, pessimistic about. But actually, Japanese companies and corporations, they take it as an opportunity uh, for their business. その高齢化の最先進国なので、フロントランナー。で、この課題解決モデルは世界に通用するので、まあその解決モデルを作ろうとまあ企業の人は取り組んでます。uh, the key was for those uh, Japanese companies who are actively trying to cultivate the market uh, in terms of uh, uh, aging society are senior shift or shift to senior people, or we call it the silver innovation. Uh, so we, uh, Japan is a front runner in uh, aging in the world. That means you know, we can uh, come up with a solution model and we can share it with the rest of the world. So uh, the key point I want to emphasize finally is you know, uh, rather than Japanese corporations you know, are competing with each other in terms of coming up with, up, uh, uh, with that solution uh, model uh, for in society, they collaborate each other and they cooperate each other to come up with the best model uh, to address the aging society. That is the key point. All right, excellent. So we'll take question in the middle. Thank you. We'll uh, I'm Vikas Gadre from Bombay Chamber of Commerce, India. We have looked at this problem from a little different perspective and a very short question. Uh, the chamber had looked at the entire migration, the aging population in Europe and US and also the costs which are going up, and migration is inevitable, there's no choice. But 
the Indian companies, the members of the chamber, are looking at this as a symptom by 2025 2030. We may really have a shortage of very niche human capital in Indian companies working in India. Most of it may have migrated out. And are there any suggestions from the panelists as to how do we arrest this? It cannot be stopped, but how can we at least reduce this migration of very niche human capital talent which goes out from India to other countries? Thank you very much. Interesting. Dimitri? Uh, this, <clears throat> this is an excellent and difficult question, so I don't know whether to thank you or, or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, what you're describing is already happening in many places and it is going to intensify in the future. It's not just India. You know, China produces about 17 million people per year with university degrees. 17 million people. And by the admission of the Chinese leadership, only about 300,000 to 500,000 of them are people who can compete in an international environment. So, they're doing two things trying to produce more of the better graduates and opening up to immigration from elsewhere. And I suspect you, particularly in India, with your exceptional technical technology schools, I'm sorry if I have the name uh, wrong, the polytechnics, whatever it is you call them, will continue to grow them. You recall that 10, 15 years ago you doubled you know, the incoming classes on these schools from 100,000 a year to 200,000 a year, you will do more than that. And you're going to both try to bring back some of your best expats and open up to immigration from outside. But the key takeaway in these kinds of conversations is that we all need to work together in order to produce more of the people that we all want. Okay, we'll take the one in the front first, then left, then we'll go there. We have too many microphones already in the <laughs> stage. So go ahead, sir. My name is Leonardo Simonelli. I am the president of the Italian Chamber of Commerce in London, in, for UK, but uh, I am also the president of the Association of All the Italian Chamber of Commerce Abroad, which are okay. 84. And I have a question which I think is not too difficult because I suggest also a, a solution. First of all, let's congratulate the panel. Uh, I'm uh, very sorry that uh, there are not more Italian politicians to the audience because <laughs> I think it would be That's ve good, actually. very <laughs> instructive. Uh, uh, I like the, the global perspective that has been given, the scenario, and also uh, the, the data which, uh, uh, in, a, in a way, uh, we represent uh, thing to fight the, the fear because you know migration has been always here. Uh, in the past, uh, maybe has been even bigger than it is now because now, uh, together with the movement of people, there is a movement of news. So, in a, but before there was just a movement of people. So I think we have to face this problem with uh, uh, seeing the possibility more than uh, the danger. Uh, you know that in Italy and indeed in Europe, uh, this is the topic of the day. Now, if you look at the number, they are big, but they are nothing in comparison with the migration of Italian abroad. You know, and uh, uh, more than I think, uh, listening also to the data given by the United States, uh, uh, Italy, as many developing countries, need this kind of uh, help because uh, the aging population that need a lot of uh, support that unfortunately the family or the big family they can't give anymore. So I have here a proposition which I would like to share. For the Italian which have emigrated a lot in the past, a solution has been to establish Chamber of Commerce abroad. The Chamber of Commerce that have uh, been uh, established for 130 years, and this has helped a lot the interface and the eradication with the population, uh, showing immediately the added economic value of the presence, and integrating, which is the, the most thing, following the rules, because that's another aspect. Now, many other nations have done the same. 
in, uh, in London, there are about 65 foreign chamber in London, and uh, I'm also in the British Chamber of Commerce for Italy. In Italy, there are about uh, 75 uh, foreign chamber. I think this kind of association, uh, which are a spontaneous association, can help a lot. And they belong uh, to uh, the family of the chamber, so that uh, I think uh, could share the same value, could share. But I'm very grateful to the panel, and I would like, if it's possible, to have uh, some of the, for instance, your first slide, uh, which uh, show all the, the movement. Definitely. Very nice to have. Thank I you very much. It. Thanks for the comment. Okay, we'll take your comments and then yours. Unfortunately, we have only a few minutes, so please keep yeah, it short. My name is Walid Tawil. I come from ICC Jordan. Uh, I thank you for this uh, opportunity to let me speak. I want to address two questions, in fact. The first question, we remember that uh, there was in the past the Barcelona pr process, which was also combined with the Europe Partenaria. The, the program was to develop the South and to develop partnership between developed countries and developing countries. That is to create more jobs in the, in the South or the developing countries so to lessen the, the, uh, the immigration. The, so the question, should we see more now in that direction that would help uh, face the, the illegal immigration, let's say. Okay. Uh, the other side is, do we think that the developed countries should stop these immigration programs to take all the skilled and educated people from the developing countries because they know that every doctor or engineer has costed his country a lot to become. Any engineer could cost $200,000 at least to become an engineer. So now they are opening these programs. They are taking the capital of the developing countries. In fact, uh, without being responsible. My question is, should the private sector in the developed countries push, put pressure on their governments to stop this? Thank you. Okay, this is very, very interesting perspective. Again, I mean, like to see it from private sector. Is, uh, y usually we, we like to allow the mobility flexible and uh, capitals with their uh, human or finance should just move the, the right way. But but very interesting, looking at cooperation, maybe to reduce this immigration, whether legal or illegal. Maybe uh, the I'll panel can to, comment on this. I'll be happy to talk to both parts of the question. Um, to paraphrase Churchill very badly, um, all of these processes, the Barcelona process, the this process, the that process, die because of lack of interest in them. In order for these to move anywhere, you have to really tend to them and care for them. You need to put money, you need to put political energy, etc., etc. That is why you, the Barcelona process didn't go very much anywhere because it did not have advocates, true advocates within the European Union. France cared for it for a while, the Iberian countries for a while, but it atrophied and pretty much has died. On the taking still people from the developing countries, that's a very, very difficult and legitimate question. And I will only point to the legitimacy of the question. As you know, many of you who are from Southern European countries or Eastern European countries, EU member states I'm talking about, know that in the last four or five years, an awful lot of your nationals have been emigrating from your countries to go to other parts of the world because there are opportunities there. And that has created a furor within the European Union trying to figure out how to stop that hemorrhaging of talent. In reality, what they're experiencing is the same thing that you're describing. In other words, talent from developing countries coming to developed countries. And there is no way to stop that. You know, unless we decide to simply try to stop emigration more generally, you can't stop that. But what you can do is you can start thinking together with the countries that lose that talent about how to replace that talent. The idea here is to produce more 
of everything on the expectation that more will leave, but also more will stay in these countries and become the engines of change. But also, uh, I would like to hear your views, uh, Amy, on this, because there was a time where American multinationals start moving outside the U.S. to Japan, Vietnam, a few other places to look for uh, whether cheaper resources or, or whatever, but for, you know, better competitiveness. This is why they go there. And maybe with that, they stop migrating these workers to their own country. And I know after the crisis, Americans start asking these companies to come back, and some of them did. So what's the perspective, maybe more or less aligned with the cooperations between nations to reduce this mobility? Well, I think that on the U.S. side, uh, many of our members, especially our big multinational companies who are active in the U.S. Chamber, have seen over um, the last 30 years uh, arc of change where uh, the competition from many other countries has increased and therefore certain aspects of how U.S. companies do business um, has changed and responded responded to that. I, I just would say as an example, in our manufacturing sector, which I think uh, you're one of the things you're thinking of, we have companies that um, do 80%, 85% of their research and development in the United States, but only sell 30% of their machinery or equipment in the United States. And in the past, they might have one competitor, one competing manufacturer in China, and today they have 100. And so if that company wants to sell products in China, they need to develop and be the first to the market with the new product, and they need to have the right resources, the right engineers to help develop, to continue to develop those products. And in the United States, in our educational system, about 50% of all graduate students mm -hmm. who are earning science and engineering degrees at U.S. universities are foreign-born students. Mm -hmm. So our member companies, when they're recruiting at a U.S. university, have a 50-50 chance of the person they might select that they think is the best for, to help them develop that R and to do that R and D and contribute to that, that that individual, that scientist or engineer, might not be an American, so they want to be able to retain that person who we, as U.S. taxpayers, have already invested in to do research in the U.S. at university to help compete on the global front. But right. I think, in some ways, it kind of goes back to what Dimitri said in his introduction that we're seeing all of us in different ways, whether we're talking about trafficking, whether we're talking about aging society, whether we're talking about what the needs are for developing uh, countries, uh, particularly in Africa, mm -hmm. that there is a big change from who do we want to come to where do we want to go. And I think that part of the answer to your question is that if the workers want to go someplace else, um, we, as the businesses, I have to keep up as opposed to think that we can control it. All right, I appreciate that. Last question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Basi Edem. I'm the president of the Nigerian Chambers of Commerce. Um, looking at uh, my question, actually goes to Yuma Mulumbi's ref. Um, in the African re West African region, we operate a situation where we all have um, there is a unified passport that, that allows freedom of movement. We even got to the extent of trying to get a uniform, you know, a uni uniform uh, currency. But the problem is um, employers are quite prepared to engage best skills in each of the countries. People have gone extra way to learn languages. You know, we have both Francophone and Anglophone in West Africa. The Anglophones once have learned Francophones, French. The, uh, French, the uh, Francophone ones have learned English. But there is continued issue of having to employ, that's mobility of employment. People moving from one country within the same region to the other country, the employers are very ready to employ them, 
but there's interference from the government as to, you know, trying to keep jobs for their own nationals. So I don't, I don't know how the CPC CAF can help us to ensure that uh, we allow this freedom, free mobility of employment. Steve? Thank you for the question. Uh, CPCCAF can help, I mean, chambers can help by the lobbying actions they are, intent they are doing, uh, actually. But uh, what I was talking about is not administrative problem. It's uh, in Ivory Coast, there had been like 1 million, 1 million point five people from Burkina Faso went to work in the cocoa agriculture. But with the crisis, they have been put out, put out of, Africa, of uh, Ivory Coast. It was not the state. It was people in the agriculture everywhere who had no jobs. So uh, I think the main problem is the lack of jobs than the, the, the administrative problems. But anyway, in, with the integration, the original integration, West Africa by uh, CDAO, ECOWAS, sorry, or SADEC, uh, there are progress on the way to, uh, to, 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 to fluidify the, the movements. Uh, but the states are quite weak as well. So it's, uh, I think it's a long process. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, we run out of time. However, the speakers will be around uh, if you have any maybe comments or a question to have with them after the session. So, uh, actually, yesterday at the opening, uh, uh, ICC Chairman uh, Terry McCrow said, uh, we need going forwards, we need the growth, and we need creations of jobs, which will lead to prosperity. And for any economy, uh, for the global economy to stay competitive, the issue of mobility is important. And uh, we believe with the globalization, also humans are globalized. It just, of course, with the governments and the restrictions that just sometimes lead to different things and different ways of doing uh, things. Just, I'm just going to maybe repeat something you said, uh, Sarmad and uh, Dimitri. We need, of course, uh, this is a necessity and this is something desirable. And uh, mobility, it's not something, uh, it's not a problem, but uh, a reality, and we just have to do it in a managed way and in orderly way. I would like to thank the speakers for uh, their presentations, speeches, and comments. I would like to thank you all for being here with us and uh, your enthusiasm and questions. Thank you all.